welcome um, to this Open Table Network Q&A webinar um, this evening. It's really good for us to, um, to be together. Um, the Open Table as Network, as you know, is a growing partnership of Christian worship communities that affirm and welcome people who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer or questioning intersex and asexual, LGBTQIA plus for short, our, and our family, friends and all of our allies. The network's been created by and for LGBTQIA plus people, and churches don't always feel safe or welcoming for us, but our name, Open Table, is quite literally an open invitation to come in just as you are and be with us in a safe, affirming community. Um, and so following our success, we've been doing kind of these webinars for a while and following our success with our patrons um, that are still available on our YouTube channel, if you don't mind me plugging that for a second. Um, this month, we wanted to try out something a little bit different. So instead of having an interviewer and an interviewee, um, really what Alex and I are going to try and do this evening is, is kind of have a dialogue together around a range of kind of issues related to um, being trans, to um, being non-binary, to being, um, you know, around what government thinks, what the church thinks, just, and we're going to just kind of kick loads of things around really. So um, if there are other things you'd like us to kind of comment on or talk about, please do let us know in the chat. We'd love to, um, if there are other issues that we can we can discuss, then we're, we're kind of really happy to do. But um, just to let you know, we are going to be talking about things like LLF, um, as well as um, kind of all sorts of things really, kind of our spiritual lives and kind of um, our, our histories and our, you know, and what we're trying to achieve through the Open Table Network. So all sorts of stuff that we're gonna, we're gonna try and cover. So let me introduce Alex and then Alex is going to introduce me um, and we'll go from there. So Alex is my co-chair at the Open Table Network. Um, Alex grew up in Scotland, um, first on the West Coast and then in Edinburgh and before going, before going to study music in Manchester. Um, early into their degree, Alex came out as trans and began to transition towards male. During their studies, Alex felt a calling to ministry. And after two years working in a university chaplaincy, Alex trained for the URC ministry in Cambridge and is now completing a PhD in trans theology and ministering with the social media based community, uh, church community, Church Spacious. Alex is passionate about inclusion and diversity and writes, speaks and facilitates training in this area. Alex is also a member of the Iona community, we're going to talk about that too, um, and is passionate about diverse forms of Christian community, particularly those that centre on social justice and accessibility. So that is Alex. Thank you, Sarah. And so Sarah and I began to co-chair the Open Table Network last year. Um, after I have to say, Sarah worked very hard to persuade me to, to join her as co-chair. And we've developed a really strong working relationship from that starting point. Having grown up in Southampton, Sarah didn't go to church until she was 17, when her faith journey really got underway. Since then, she moved to Yorkshire to go to university and settled here. She had a family, helped lead a church and has worked within a variety of large companies, heading up their learning and development and talent functions. Um, after a break from church four years ago, Sarah began worshipping at Ripon Cathedral in Yorkshire, um, where she's now PCC secretary, part of Messy Cathedral team, which sounds like a lot of fun, and also a school gover governor. Sarah knew that she was transgender from an early age and formally started her transition process in 2017. So that's Sarah. Perfect. Thank you. So Alex, let's start with you. Um, I know you've captured, captured your story really well in your book, um, Transgender, Christian, Human, and it is a really good book. So um, I reviewed it um, for, on our um, website, on the OTN, um, on the Open Table um, network website it's really worth kind of reading that review but also reading more importantly the book um so you've captured all that kind of um stuff there so, but for those of people who are here today who maybe haven't encountered you before can you just give us a really quick potted history of maybe your early life and your faith journey thank you yeah so um i when i talk about my childhood i often start by saying that when i was a child i thought i was an alien and I say that most often when I'm talking with children or in school groups, because that's something that they can find quite humorous and kind of identify this idea that you think that you're an alien who's going to be beamed up somewhere. But as an adult, I actually recognize that it's quite sad that I felt like that. I felt so alienated, so alone, that I genuinely believed I just didn't belong. Um, I didn't fit. I didn't really feel like I had any friends or any idea of who I was. 
Um, but when but I went to an all girls school um, and when I moved to secondary school, I moved to a mixed school so that I could go to a specialist music school and there were boys there and I was immediately pretty sure that I was a boy, but this was a wee while ago now and there wasn't really a lot of trans visibility at all and in particular there was no trans masculine visibility whatsoever so I didn't know that it was possible that I could be a boy and I just felt kind of completely lost and isolated. My dad was a minister in the Church of Scotland so I'd kind of grown up in that church context but he'd stopped being a minister to become a hospital chaplain. So I started to go to a charismatic evangelical church by myself. And I absolutely loved it because, you know, there was great music and everyone was really friendly and it was very touchy feely. And as a kind of quite emotional teenager, it was somewhere where I felt like I had relationships that meant something. But I went um, on a mission trip with that church, which I now see as quite problematic to Kenya and experienced forms of conversion therapy there, which kind of completely destroyed my faith for a period of time. I was asked to leave the church um, shortly after that and didn't really go to church until I went to university and started to meet other trans people, meet inclusive Christians for the first time ever and was able to start coming out as trans which I'll say a bit more about later. But so that's kind of a potted history of the early years. But to, to kind of summarize, I just say I was a very, very unhappy child um, and even more so young person. And it wasn't until I met other trans people that I could continue both with my life journey and my spiritual journey. Um, so yeah, that's me. Uh, what about you? At what point um, did you kind of come out, Sarah? You know I realized at a very young age that um, I felt different. And I kind of, I literally remember the kind of the day when I realized that I didn't feel like um, I was the boy that everyone thought I was. Um, and so I, I was outside, um, it will mean nothing to anyone, but outside Mrs. Cashman's classroom um, in my school and just kind of just, felt we were playing kind of dressing up games and some people were kind of dressed up and others weren't and I just felt this huge kind of um, disconnect and I remember at, this, at that time thinking I know that I feel like I'm not a boy but also um, I, I can never tell anyone this I have to kind of keep this a, a total secret from everyone I and I, I'm, I, I'm fascinated by your journey in that when you talk about kind of having had that confidence kind of to and or kind of maybe just de desperate need one or the other would be interesting to kind of know um to kind of come out to people because I think at that stage for me it was very much like oh how can I kind of keep this stuff um done and I I, I didn't become a Christian until I was as you said until I was 17 but actually I spent a huge amount of time in that kind of early stage um you know really kind of reaching out to God and praying to God I mean literally I would spend one hour every evening I literally kind of timed it um praying to try and um persuade God that the next day when I woke up that I would wake up as a, as a girl and I literally would kind of just pray and pray and pray and I was disappointed and kind of sad every every morning when that happened when it didn't happen um and so after a while I kind of gave up really and if anything, at that point, I guess my only real thoughts were, how do I stop this? And that's when that kind of almost like years of stopping this, you know, how do I how do I not do this anymore kind of um, came in. And that's and that that was really kind of um, really tough, really. Um, my family were, you know, as I know now, very, very accepting. And, you know, hopefully we can talk a bit about that um, that later. But I think at the time they wouldn't really have, have kind of got it. Um, and so. I guess a lot of the time I was looking for a, you know, I felt very ashamed of myself. I felt that it was very wrong. And I almost was looking for times at which I could, and ways in which I could kind of stop feeling like this. Um, and so, you know, church was, when I started a church, it was definitely about a, I'd seen kind of, and had a lot of my, um, you know, the kind of objections I had towards faith, why I didn't believe kind of from coming from a, a very much non-Christian kind of background very much kind of, um, you know, had a lot of those issues kind of knocked out of the way. But I think somewhere in the background was also me thinking there must be a way I can kind of, I can, this this is going to provide me an answer to kind of, to stop feeling like this. Um, and so to answer the question that you, you asked, um, I kind of came out gra very gradually. Um, so I did come out kind of around 18 or 19 
um, to, um, well, no, probably a little bit younger than that, maybe about 17, to a couple of people who just utterly rejected me um, for kind of coming out. And then I, they weren't church folk, but then I did um, kind of, as I went to university, met a church that was really into um, kind of all sorts of like deliverance type stuff and all sorts of other things. And so kind of used that as an opportunity really to kind of start thinking about, you know, maybe the church could help me to kind of to stop being this. So I came out to various people and they kind of confirmed, yes, this is a bad thing. Yes, we can help you to kind of um, to resolve this. And that's that's where I spent years really of my life was going in a cycle of confession, of trying to overcome this and and kind of and and get past it. And it wasn't really until, as as is often the irony, I guess, it wasn't really until I came out to a non-Christian. Um, so someone who didn't, you know, doesn't profess to have any kind of any any faith journey at all, really, particularly. Um, and and they were the first person ever to say, we love you even more now that we know you're trans. And it just it broke my heart because it was the first time anyone had ever said that. Um, and then then the coming out journey kind of I, I'd learned at that stage that actually every time I came out in church, I had a really negative reaction every time I came out to my friends and people were kind of outside of church. I got a good reaction and it was it was quite interesting I think really and eventually led me to a point where I kind of I diverted from the church really because I just I was like actually this isn't stopping and I need to kind of work out how to how to kind of um how to be more accepting of myself really so I, you talked a little bit about kind of the Kenya experience was that where you came out or was that kind of was it earlier than that later than that? I know that was quite a, a formative experience for you yeah so I came out as gay so as a gay woman at the time um when I was in Kenya kind of by accident people were talking in a joking way about people they were attracted to and I named someone who was female um without just innocently really I didn't I hadn't had cause to think until that time about whether that would be a problem or not and clearly it was I came out to my parents um in that way shortly afterwards and that was okay um but I didn't come out as trans until a few years later. Um, so after a few years of kind of complete disconnection with the church and having had quite a difficult first year at university, someone invited me to um, a local LGBT youth group. And there I met other trans people for the first time. And it just immediately gave me a safe place to start to come out. So I started coming out there. They supported me and called me the name that I wanted to be called and all of those sorts of things and gradually helped me to come out to other people. And it was about the same time that I walked through the doors of an inclusive church um, for the first time ever. And just things like realizing that I could read the Bible for myself and that it didn't really seem to say what I'd been told it said were completely transformative for me. And I don't, I don't think if I hadn't walked into that church that I ever would have gone to church again. I needed to go to a church that was so, so inclusive um, and perhaps even went further than being inclusive to be able to kind of come, come back to that. But then that church was also an essential support during my transition. My parents struggled a little bit during the early times of my transition. And so I was in church almost every day getting support and help. And I know how privileged I was to be in a setting where that was possible, really. Yeah, no, I completely, because I, I mean, certainly for me, it wasn't really until I decided to transition and, and got to and, and went to Ripon Cathedral that I found an inclusive church. And up until that point, I just, I, I sincerely never believed that I would ever find a church that would actually be okay with this, because my only experience had been of churches that that weren't. It's really... I know, you know, a lot on the forums and kind of and Facebook groups and stuff, it's, you know, it's almost like the number one question people ask is like, you know, is there a church in my area that will will kind of accept me? Because it just it makes life so, so much easier. Um, you talked a bit about your family. You said they struggled kind of a little bit kind of early on. Can you are you able to talk a bit more about that? At first, they struggled quite a bit. And I think I did that thing that I know quite a few other trans people who have shared similar stories that we're so it's so important to us to finally be able to start talking about who we are, that sometimes we can go at about 100 miles an hour. Um, and, you know, I was very public about my transition very quickly and my family didn't respond well to that. Um, and I think there was kind of a bit of responsibility on both sides there. I don't think I was as sensitive as I could have been, um, but they also had had no kind of awareness of, of trans identities, no support um, for them, really. So 
at the time it was really difficult there were kind of two or three years of us kind of not really being in contact all of the time um and it wasn't until quite a way into my transition when I was starting to become a lot healthier and happier that we were able to reconnect and reform that relationship and now we get on well um and my parents are really supportive of all trans people um and kind of look back on on our past very differently do they almost regret that time where they kind of have they reconcile that with themselves because I can imagine you know knowing that they care so much for you now and are so supportive I wonder if they kind of that they, they that pains them that period so in my book um my mum's written a bit of a chapter and she has written a little bit about kind of having some senses of regret yeah. but it's not something we've ever really talked about I think to be fair we don't talk very much about the time around my transition mm -hmm. um you know it's like any relationship I think that's broken down for a period of time and then reformed you have kind of bits where you're a bit careful to to not wound each other um so I don't know but I think that there is probably a little bit of, of pain and regret there yeah. Um, how about you? How have your family been with your transition? So um, I guess uh, my, my father died a long time ago. So when I was 24, so so never kind of knew really. Um, but my mum, my brother was the first person to find out. And, you know, I, I caveat it with he's now one of my big supporters. Um, but at the time, I, he he found that really, really difficult and didn't. And it, there wasn't a kind of a faith dimension to that. He just found it difficult as on a on a, on a kind of personal level really didn't know how to process that information I don't think I'd always been you know and and this is something that I think is is of my growing up is thinking I need to be strong I need to kind of you know get past I need to you know be not not to have this as something that is kind of um holds me back and I you know I'm going to be strong at work and I'm going to you know push things forward all that type of stuff and I think you know what I was announcing to him was so at contrary with what with the image that he had of who I was I'd fooled him so well I guess that I think just mm. couldn't kind of process it and it it was always really fun and interesting because my mum was my mum was great and always was always hugely supportive after she um found out but I remember um when I decided to transition um obviously my brother was one of the people I was interested in how is he going to kind of take this knowing that early reaction and he um it's just out of the blue one evening he kind of he texted me and said right, okay, I know it's been a long time, but I've wrapped my head around this now. Uh, you know, can I see what you're going to look like? Can I see one of your photos? And, you know, being, you know, I was, oh, no, I hardly have any photos that I can show you. But like, what, which of the hundreds of <laughs> thousands of, of, of selfies shall I, shall I kind of send you? Um, so I sent some across and, and he and his wife were just very, very lovely and gave me some really kind of kind um, feedback and were just, were, were very good. They did kind of ruin it a little bit at that moment by saying, um, you'll, you'll be horrified at this, Alex, I can't if I've ever told you this, but um, they said, oh, can we send you a photo of what we think you were going to look like? <laughs> we was always like, maybe not. You've been doing really well so far. Let's not go any further at this point. And they sent me a picture of Mrs. Brown. And I was like, oh, oh no, dear. I really am not going to look like that at all. That's not, um, that's not going to happen. The one that scared me the most was really my kids. Um, so I'd, I, along the way, I'd got, I kind of got married. I'd, um, I'd had three, um, three children. Um, uh, so three kind of boys um, who are 18, 17 and 16 now. So we're kind of 14, 13, 12 at, at the kind of, at the time. And I went on holiday with them. Um, oh, and, uh, and I went on that holiday thinking, this could be the last time I ever have any contact with them. It was, it's the thing that scared me the most in my whole life um, was going on that holiday and every day kind of counting down to when we came home because I knew that on the day after we came home, I was going to tell them and the day after I was going to, going to start, I was going to go full time and start my transition. Um, and so we got back from the holiday and I sat down with them at the, um, at the kitchen table and was, you know, I, how do you break that news to, to to your kids in a in a positive way? And they just so I said to them, "Well, do you know what trans trans people are?" Um, and they they said, oh, "Of course." <laughs> but I was like, "Oh, okay, okay, well, maybe you know, this may be okay." And I said, "Oh, you know, well, me and your mum are going to be separating because I'm transgender and I'm going to be transitioning." And they were just amazing. They just said, "That's absolutely fine. We're we're really really okay with that." And I was. 
I was so shocked actually that I just burst into tears because I just had been building this up in my mind so much that this was going to be really challenging. Um, and ironically, I've said this a few times before, but it just was amazed me that, you know, when we reflected on it a little bit afterwards um, with them, you know, they, I told them that, you know, the marriage was splitting up, I'm leaving home, that um, I'm transitioning. And they were like, yeah, we can't believe you cried. <laughs> it was like, well, well, I'm, I'm just, I'm amazed, absolutely amazed that that's your kind of, you can be so incredible about it, really. Um, so yeah, so kind of a bit mixed, but kind of, but the kids was the really important one to me. And that was, um, that, that, yeah, that, that made the biggest difference, I guess, really. So uh, back to you. So um, you've gone on, obviously, after all of that, to become an ordained minister, an online church leader, author, speaker. Um, and the thing I was interested in was obviously um, your ordination process. So as a kind of non-binary person, were you, was your denomination really happy for you to kind of to transition? Did they have any challenges, reluctances? Was it, was it a pretty, pretty straightforward process? So in the kind of initial application process, which we call candidating in the URC, it was generally fine. There was more of a problem with me being a young person um, than a trans person. And they generally seemed to understand that transness might have meant that I'd had some different experiences in life that could actually be useful to bring into the process. The exception to that was one person on the panel who basically sat me down and said, well, if a businessman in a suit comes into your church, you know, a perfectly ordinary man, how are you going to relate to that person? And for a start, I kind of thought, well, that's actually quite unlikely, given the demographics of the URC. Um, but I also thought, well, I'll relate to them just like I relate to anyone else. There seemed to be this sense that as an LGBT person, I'd only be able to relate to other LGBT people. And that felt um, strange. But I did get through the candidating process. College initially were very accepting um, and in lots of ways were very accepting. At first, I had a tutor who kind of encouraged me to be in. And at the time, as a relatively young, not very confident person, I was like, yeah, 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 I mustn't talk about being trans. And it wasn't until I switched tutors a bit in that I realized that actually being trans was one of the things that I was called to talk about and that there were people who had questions um, and who needed support that just wasn't there in the church and that actually it was important for me to be open. Um, I also met and married my other half in theological college, which I wouldn't really recommend, particularly if you're LGBT. There was very much a sense that we were definitely more promiscuous than other people and that everyone thought we were doing lots of things that we weren't doing. And that caused quite a big problem. And it wasn't really until I left college and was able to look back that I realized quite how much of that was about the fact that I was trans. Um, and now, well, the denomination is very supportive of me. I would want to say that. But there is always a sense of, but you could just stop talking about this stuff. You know, you could just be a normal minister. Um, wouldn't it be easier if you didn't? And that, for me, that's a problem, particularly as a non-binary person, that actually it's part of who I am. And just as a heterosexual married cisgender um, minister talks about their kids um, during a church service, of course, I talk about aspects of being trans. Um, my past isn't something I'm going to hide or lie about. And sometimes that presents challenges. And it does kind of present quite a big question as to whether I would ever be able to get a kind of traditional church call and it started to make me question whether I'd ever want a traditional church call um, just that sense that there are always going to be people disapproving of you or questioning your call because of your identity um, yeah that's that's tricky um, I know um, you obviously and we mentioned this in your introduction you participate in the Iona and the Iona community I was just wondering uh, um, alongside of all that because there's so many things that you kind of you do and you're so kind of busy how do you keep kind of you know your your spiritual disciplines going how do you keep your faith fresh when there's just so much on your plate and you seem to give so much in terms of your you know out out spiritually um is is Iona kind of the key to that or is are there other things that you kind of you do Iona is definitely one of the keys and for those who don't know a lot about the Iona community we keep a rule and part of that rule is working for social justice and we account to each other for how we spend our time and our money um, and those accounting relationships are really supportive as well. So I have a local family group who I go and spend time with. 
Um, and it's just really good to have a place where I can talk really, really openly and honestly, um, particularly as someone who maybe wouldn't be able to talk openly and honestly about everything about myself um, within my denomination. Um, and besides that, I think knowing that what I'm doing is for multiple purposes is really important. I think if your commitment is to one organization um, or one very specific set of beliefs that can feel quite boxing, um, it can feel quite like it ties you down. And so actually having different communities and different outlets is quite important to me. Um, and I would also say things outside of religious community altogether are really important for me in terms of spiritual discipline. So going for walks, doing arts and crafts, um, thinking about eco living, all of that kind of stuff um, is what feeds me. I'm not one of the ministers who would go to an extra church service in the week to get spiritual feeding. For me, it, it, that's that bit of my spiritual discipline is outside of the church. Yeah. How, how about you? Um, so I'm quite extroverted uh, in the main. So I find kind of sitting, you know, in the kind of the in a in a calming room and kind of being in a really kind of placid kind of environment quite difficult. I'm not kind of someone who finds that I, you know, the mood grabs me sometimes. And <laughs> so I kind of that will that will happen. Um, but actually a lot of the time it's more like really loud kind of praise music. And you know, while I'm kind of either doing something else or I'm dancing around the kind of the the house or and that I think it's almost that kind of outburst of energy that kind of then gets me into being able to actually then kind of relax a little bit more and and kind of calm down and and kind of do it but um for for a number of years I've kind of what the thing I find really kind of helps to center me is actually and I don't do this in a kind of a overly kind of formalized way but I really love the act of taking communion it's one of the things that I think is just um, phenomenal um, and I just so actually kind of if I really really want the center and get focused then often actually sitting down and just taking kind of um, bread and, and wine or whatever is kind of available um, and you know and and going through that act of communion actually is the thing that really helps to kind of center me back and, and calm me to the point where actually I can I feel like I can you know put aside because actually the thing I struggle with most is kind of pushing all the things out of my head because um, there's often so much going on that it's quite difficult to kind of um, to break through that really. Mm. Yeah. yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so I know that you planned an ordained life in the church and that kind of because of the conflict between your gender identity and your denominations policy, you felt unable to do that. So you ended up going into business. I wonder if you could say a bit about that and also about I've heard you say that you kind of believe that you do within business what you were called to do within the church. So what do you mean? Yeah, no, I'm really happy to answer that. And I've seen we've had we've had a question in from someone saying um, that they feel like they can't become a, a priest because of their um, because of being um, being gay um, and actually you know, does that kind of, you know, so what do you do instead? Do you just kind of push on and, and, and ignore that? And I guess for me, certainly at the time, I, I just felt like I, I, I couldn't find a way of, of kind of being accepted. So it felt like the only way to go was to kind of get a, a job. And so I got the most kind of temporary job that I could find at the time and just thought, oh, I'm just going to, you know, just push on and, and kind of do this. So I started working in a, in a call centre um, selling boilers <laughs> for British gas um, was kind of where I started out and it was just and I thought well this will kind of keep me going for, for a while and then actually you know very quickly it, it kind of appeared that the organization had very different plans for me really and so I got put onto this project and then eventually kind of got moved into the center of the of the organization at a kind of a, a group level and realized that actually I had a real kind of a, and I'd never put the two and two together at the time but had a real affinity for um for teaching for um communicating for you know educating and so you know ended up working in kind of um learning development management development type um type roles doing all sorts of of kind of stuff around you know kind of teaching people all sorts of kind of management issues including things like performance management that that type of that type of stuff um and then bit by bit I kind of you know I, I tried out different things and and got to got to the opportunity to do different things I ended up at 
27 kind of managing eight, about 80 people um, in this kind of huge nationwide kind of team of, of trainers and, and kind of educators. They were an amazing, amazing bunch of people. Um, so just kind of bit by bit and arrived eventually, um, probably in my kind of early 30s, um, in a role as head of talent for a particular organization. And some of you will be thinking, what the earth does a head of talent do? You know, so imagining as of kind of Simon Cowell type um, <laughs> type person. Um, and not far from the truth. No, I, I got very good at um, spotting um, people's potential. So kind of really kind of understanding what, what are they really good at? How could they contribute more to the organization? And got very good at working with people to understand how we could get kind of more out of them how we they could deliver what they were kind of born to deliver as it as it were what they you know what really made them kind of unique and and kind of individual and as i've kind of reflected back on it i you know to your point i kind of i feel like that's what god probably called me to do in the church was actually to help people to unlock their potential and to kind of work out what is it that god has made them to be and it makes me sad really i mean it makes me happy on a financial level <laughs> Has actually worked out quite you know quite well really from that perspective but from a, on a personal level I find it quite sad that you know over those years I kind of felt like I was using those gifts you know for my own kind of purpose rather than actually for something that you know maybe could have, have benefited um benefit the church and helping the church because I think you know half the time I think people are frustrated because they don't feel like they're in the right place for them doing the things that God's really put in their heart to kind of um to do and I think if you can unlock that in people then actually there's there's kind of there's real power real power in that and so I find it quite sad really that I've not been able to um to do that but I know that kind of you you feel similarly because we've talked about this quite a lot and I know that you know that you know to a degree that you've always kind of it's made you feel like you've you know what you wanted to do in the church you find hard to kind of to get to that and so even now you're starting to think about actually how can you work with the kind of with more secular businesses i guess to um to to kind of take on organizational work around diversity inclusion the equality act things like that how are you finding that going and what is that different is it the same what, what how's that working out for you yeah so while I was doing my first degree in music I did quite a lot of diversity and inclusion work in secular organizations and I found that it was really valued people really cared about hearing our stories um, and people really cared about making plans to to do better as it were on inclusion and diversity and coming into the church I felt that that was part of what I I brought um, to my work in the church and at a kind of central level there are a few people in the church who do see the need for that kind of work and who do take it seriously but on the other hand it doesn't really feel at the moment like the church in the UK is very um cares very much about being up to date with best practice in terms of equalities and so for example with the equalities act there often tends to be an assumption um that churches are just exempt from the whole thing and that's not the case at all church exemptions are so so limited um but i don't think most churches you'd walk in and there wouldn't be an understanding of the equality act and there needs to be and a particular area um that i'm passionate about is autism because i am neurodivergent i'm autistic and i've found that getting reasonable adjustments in the church um for autistic people is really really tricky um and so I'm really encouraging the church and in particular, in particular my denomination to do some more work on DEI, um, diversity and inclusion. But I also think that I can take some of that learning out into other organizations as well, because the church is one of the most challenging places to have these conversations, because there is this assumption that we don't have to necessarily follow all of the rules. Um, that actually to take some of the lessons learned in, in dealing with some of those really binary debates in the church and take them into other areas, I think could be quite helpful. Because I think as sad as it, and, and in some ways ironic as it is, religion is often one of the kind of foundational causes underlying um, conflict and underlying kind of a lack of inclusion, really. Obviously, every church denomination is kind of going through that, that kind of journey themselves, I guess, at the moment. And, you know, as well as, I know this is a broader kind of issue than just the LGBTQIA kind of um, kind of element, but I guess the church's effort really has been around that space has really been kind of wrapped up in it's certainly the Church of England wrapped up in the Living in Love and Faith program, 
and I know the Methodist Church, and we're going to um, hear from um, some people the next time next time round um, in the next one of these webinars around that that kind of whole journey. Um, so, I, and I know you were involved, kind of, and I saw your paper recently, which was a really great kind of um, really great read. Um, that you've kind of you're obviously quite involved in the Living in Love and Faith program from a kind of an early stage. I wondered if you know what's your take on it how how are things kind of going in terms of your thinking it was you were quite kind of um you know forthright i think in your in your recent paper yeah it's been really tricky because i have genuinely very mixed views on it and part of the mix of my views is that i'm not a church of england member um so i feel like i i shouldn't comment but having said that the llf process has continued to affect me beyond my engagement in it and I think, so on the surface level, I felt initially like it was a really good thing because to be frank, it was what the URC didn't do. Um, we had a debate about same-sex marriage and made a decision. Um, we didn't have a really kind of prolonged in-depth theological um, conversation about what it meant to be LGBTQ plus and about how churches could better include LGBTQ plus people. And because of that, some of that inclusion is still missing. So I was really optimistic about there being a possibility to kind of have some of that inclusion um, coming out of this process. But unfortunately, a lot of the power issues um, that were involved, a lot of the discipline issues, a lot of just how do we disagree with each other without hurting each other wasn't attended to as well as it might be and has meant that LLF has been able to be used um, by some people to continue to hurt um, or further hurt of other people um, recently. And I, I still have some hope. I still get messages from people um, who were on the fence and have found LLF really helpful. Um, so it's important to hold on to that. But I also think we have to be really careful with any systematic program that's just intending to kind of talk about people rather than with them. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there's quite a lot of lessons to be learned there, which is why I wrote about it. I wanted to make sure that kind of mm -hmm. academic theology didn't mm -hmm. lose sight of some of that learning. Yeah, I know that's been for me, that's been my experience so far as, you know, it's been quite, a, you know, in the diocese that I, that I, 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 um, I'm, I live within, um, you know, I know it, certainly kind of I've been part of the team kind of helping to look at how do we encourage people to engage with this um, process. And that's, you know, particularly with the bishop who is leading that within our area, that's been a really positive um, kind of process. But you kind of hear, you know, that that's not the case. And it still does feel like, you know, we're fighting to be kind of just let in a little bit. And actually mm -hmm. that should, that it shouldn't feel like, it shouldn't feel like that. I know the URC started quite early with this. How did they, how do they have, how have they maintained momentum since, or, or do you not feel they have necessarily? Um. I think what I feel is that there's still a lot of work to be done and mm. it's starting to feel like some of that work is coming to the forefront now. So recently, um, safeguarding officers in the URC have been taking a real interest in working on LGBT specific safeguarding, which I'm really, really pleased about. And we're also kind of following in the Methodist footsteps to look a little bit at inclusive language um, and ensuring that trans people are referred to correctly in all of our papers and processes, which I think is a really big step forward. But I think there are still really significant conversations about being LGBTQ plus, and I think particularly about LGBTQ plus people in ministry roles um, that need to happen, and I think need to be LGBTQ plus led. And so that's still something we're working on and is a way in which we're a step behind, even though we have same sex marriage. I think sometimes in discourse on LGBT rights, there's an assumption that same sex marriage equals LGBTQ plus equality yeah. and for trans people that's not really the case because the very law that brings in same-sex marriage causes a lot of pain and difficulty for trans people and has written inequalities into legislation so I'd like to see the church doing some work on that as well and being able to help people instead of just being completely oblivious, oblivious to it all really. Yeah do you think that um it's because there are so few of us. There's just not enough voices, or is it just that we're not being listened to in your experience? I, don't... I mean, there are really few of us uh, and fewer in, in the URC, certainly fewer out mm -hmm. um, trans ministers in the URC that, than in some other denominations. But 
I think until you tell someone real stories, it's hard for people to actually understand. So if you ask someone to look at the Same-Sex Marriage Act, for example, they'd say, well, there's nothing in here that causes a problem to trans people. It's only once you're actually talking with trans people about the real effects mm -hmm. on our lives that it makes mm -hmm. a difference. Yeah. Um, but people have to be willing to do that. You know, I'm so willing to go into churches and talk, but often there's kind of a lack of interest because mm -hmm. the church is so worried about keeping itself alive that I think it's it's hard for it to really engage in, yeah. in these questions. Other priorities, yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. Um, you kind of hinted a bit, and, and I did as well, at, at kind of transphobia outside of the church in that. Do, do, do you feel that transphobia is still alive and well out in the world? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because when I talk to friends and people I know, I kind of would say the answer is very much yes, um, that you kind of see it. And I don't think, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think for me, there's kind of two, there's two kind of lives going on. There's there's a life of um, of social media and there's a life of the rest of the world. <laughs> and I think when you go onto social media, you kind of would come away thinking that everyone is very, very kind of anti and very against kind of trans people. But actually when I get, when I go out personally in, in and talk to people I know and in, in business and all that kind of stuff, actually there's a lot of um, kindness and a lot of, a lot of support. There, there, there are definitely people out there who are kind of, who are, are transphobic and you kind of, you know, you kind of, you see that. And I, I know you're interested in kind of microaggressions and you know some other things that'd be really interesting to kind of um to hear about but broadly speaking I kind of I you know I don't in day-to-day -day activity I don't get loads and loads and loads of that um but I'm I think you know but when I talk to friends I kind of you do very much see that that's 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 very much happening I don't know I've just become adept at avoiding it um because it's certainly not because people don't realize that I'm trans because you know like 5'11 and <laughs> built quite quite big really um yeah I think yeah I think although obviously there is still transphobic violence out there I think it is the little things every day that are mm -hmm. still going on that are quite difficult yeah. for people but also it's the systems so for example things like accessing a smear test and then later a hysterectomy on yeah. the NHS was almost impossible for me yeah. because it was assumed that it was trans related care when actually it was just having a cervix and a uterus related care mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of our systems medical legal social are still really built around a gender binary and that's transphobia that hurts cis people as well as trans people um, so yeah I think a lot of it is structural um, mm -hmm. even though individuals might be moving forward society is still behind that I think a little yeah. bit behind the curve yeah I know we've talked about kind of you know I you know whilst I don't experience that I as I said, I don't put myself in in the place too at the moment. I think really, and one of the things I have a really big fear on is is you know what if I get sent to hospital or I need to go to hospital for some reason? How will that kind of be received? And you know, will I be supported? And and you know, it's I, that I, there are definitely fears there that show that on some kind of level, even if it's subconscious, I there is you know you you're, you become aware of it really. One of the areas I do feel like whilst you know maybe society is kind of moving on it feels like actually with despite the the equality act the government's actually moving backwards i don't know if you kind of agree with that or if you have kind of a a, a take on that really so it's not quite the government but in the last week po the police commissioner said that um trans people are a danger to all women so i think when you have comments like yeah. that coming from kind of the hierarchy as it yeah. were there's going to be an issue. You know, there were all sorts of promises about sorting out the Gender Recognition Act and nothing happened. Yeah. Um, regularly, the government seems to, to say, well, we either protect women or trans people, not both. Yeah. Um, so I think there are difficulties. And when you look at kind of the ratings of countries in terms of trans inclusivity, yeah. the, the um, UK is quite far down that list. And actually someone yeah. recently managed to seek asylum to move somewhere else and claim asylum because they managed to prove that it wasn't safe in England for trans yeah. people. Yeah. So I think it, it is a really big problem yeah. and change is needed, but actually the church needs to be a big part of that change because often yeah. the negative voices, even if it's not visibly obvious, are coming from the church. Yeah. Yeah, no, and I, I listened to um, uh, an interview with one of the government um, equality ministers um, recently where 
they absolutely did everything they possibly could despite persistent questioning from the um from the interviewer to say to be willing to say trans women are women trans men are men it just they just would not kind of they would not kind of agree with that and that was quite tough to hear a kind of a government minister doing that but also just on a practical level you know and you know still having things like spousal approval in the in the you know to try and get a gender recognition certificate i know that's for me personally that's what's stopping me from getting mine at the moment and it's it's really really frustrating that those changes are not being are not being made yeah um, absolutely yeah, yeah. i know that despite all of those difficulties we've talked quite a lot about our kind of inherent sense of god loving and affirming yeah, us absolutely. so what would you say to to that question do you know for, for years i really didn't um believe it i, I really i if Cole, if it's because you struggle with that i i was exactly in that kind of in that in that place and you know because that was what the church kind of reinforced to me i, I was reading the bible and um this a verse kind of just absolutely leapt out at me in a way that i'd never kind of I've seen it before because I just thought, oh, God's just never going to accept this. I'm always going to feel like this is kind of a really horrible and, and kind of tough and tough thing. And I read the verse that says, um, you know, if you're if you ask your father for bread, would they give you a stone? Um, and, you know, it, it kind of really changed my thinking around because I thought, you know, I've been I've been praying diligently for probably at that point, about 25 to 30 years for God to take this away from me, for me to be normal, not trans, whatever kind of you, you want to kind of, um, you, want, you ever want to call it. And it was the first time when I thought, actually, do you know what? You know, I've been asking for bread for all this time and all I feel like I've been given is a stone. So either one of the two things is true, either God's not real and the Bible's not true because this, this isn't what I'm getting, or actually maybe what I'm getting or what I've been getting all along is actually bread. Um, and actually maybe this is, this is okay. And it kind of started me on a journey of thinking very differently that maybe you know, coming from an attitude of, instead of coming from a starting point of God doesn't love me and how do I justify myself to coming from a point of God loves me and I don't need to justify myself and suddenly opening to that kind of that love. And then, you know, the direction of travel completely, you know, changed. And that's when I started kind of accepting that actually God does love me. And maybe that's, you know, all my f negative feelings were were wrong in the past, really. It's inspiring to me that that you went straight to a Bible quote. Um, and I feel the same that actually when we read the Bible for ourselves, God's constant care for people who are marginalized or pushed out or in between or outside of is there. Like the Bible just has such a love and passion um, for people who the religious establishment often doesn't and I think that often people talk about there being one biblical view and I kind of get confused about what bible they're reading to be honest I just have that sense through I, I love reading the bible because to me when I read the bible it says that God loves me but it's also just actually spending time out in nature spending time with good people um doing things that give you a, a feeling of that love yeah. and kind of something that I'm still learning, which is taking time to step away from debate and to actually say, do you know what? I don't need to debate. I can just be, and that's okay. And that I think takes time and I'm still not very good at it, but I'm trying really hard. Cause I think if we're constantly arguing with people who say that they're speaking for God, then it can feel like you're constantly arguing with God, but actually God's not arguing with us. No. So should we move on to open table? Yep, absolutely. Okay. So, why did you get involved? From my perspective, I, you know, having kind of, I mean, I'd not heard of Open Table kind of even probably kind of, you know, three, four years ago. And I think having kind of never really thought that a church would accept me, um, having got found a church and then found that there's this amazing network of people who all affirm and more than welcome um, LGBTQIA people into, into kind of deepening their relationship with God was just absolutely blew my mind absolutely kind of I was amazed and to find out and then start to meet some of the people who were in that kind of in that in that group in that sphere so connected to people like you to Kieran um to Kieran's lovely husband Warren who's on the call tonight you kind of you know as you meet people like that you kind of realize and I've gone to a um a retreat um that um 
um, a number of people may have gone. I know at least one person in the uh, in the audience tonight had, had kind of had gone to. Um, just made me kind of realise that actually there are people out there who really care for me and an open table was just such a place of kind of joy really um and building those relationships that i just i knew it was really really important and i guess for me it was like actually if i can do anything that's going to help facilitate other people to have access to that kind of environment then god you know that's a really amazing use, use of my time what, what absolutely about you? yeah i think similar in a way so i first experienced open table probably quite near its beginnings, really. Um, I was living in Merseyside um, in quite a difficult relationship, quite kind of socially isolated um, in my late teens and early 20s. And I met Kieran when we were doing some work together for Diversity Role Models. And he invited me to Open Table Liverpool. And that was just a really supportive and important place for me at that time. And then I have to admit, I drifted away a little bit. Um, I didn't live in places where there were open tables. And then a few years ago, Kieran got in touch and said, you know, we're setting up a network. Are you interested in being a trustee? And it just immediately brought back that sense of being more than welcome, as you say, that I'd had in that community and really wanting to make sure that that was available to everyone all over the country. And it's just been great to come together with a group of such interesting, diverse people to, to make that happen, really. Yeah. Yeah, and they are, they're a very amazing, amazing bunch of people. Um, obviously, Open Table is about tables. So if you could sit at a table with anyone, historic or alive today, who would you dine with? So mine are quite a diverse selection. Um, so first, and I think this would be, I'd answer differently every day. It depends what kind of mood <laughs> I'm in. Um, but I think Brandon Tina, um, if you haven't heard of Brandon Tina, they're the main character of a film called Boys Don't Cry. Um, it needs a massive content warning. It's a really difficult watch, but there are bits of Brandon um, as a transmasculine person, bits of his story that really um, correlate with things I've experienced. And I just really would love to meet them and be able to have a conversation about those things. Um, George McLeod, who's the founder of the Iona community. So by all accounts, he was probably actually quite a conservative traditional minister, but his whole vision for the community came out of the idea that he could bring um, working class people in the housing estates in Glasgow who were working on building sites and theological students, all men, it was a very uninclusive time, together on Iona to rebuild the abbey and that that would solve the gap between the church and society. And obviously it didn't quite go that far to, to be able to solve that gap, but I'd love to, to hear his advice for today in some ways that gap is even wider now and although I think he and I would have some quite serious differences um I think the spirit of what he was trying to do was really interesting yeah yeah and then my American grandparents because I exchanged letters with my American grandpa um just after I came out um but never met him as me and I just love to sit down and have a conversation with them as an adult um Sadly, they've passed away, so that won't happen. But yeah. um, it's good to remember them as supportive people and imagine that that conversation would actually be very yeah. healthy and good. Yeah. How about you? Um, so mine are going to, I've got quite a few as well, but um, mine are probably more realistic. So having gone through and watched all of these webinars, um, like two of my, I mean, I've loved all of them, but two of my, my favourites have been Paul Bays, um, the Bishop of Liverpool, and um, Podrick O'Tumor. Um, who's uh, both patrons and I would I mean I'm really hoping that at some stage I can actually sit around a table with them because I just loved every bit of they, what they said and I felt so encouraged after that I, I kind of started to struggle there probably are loads of people but then I my brain started going to um, people in fictional books <laughs> so actually I don't know if they count but I would there are several people I kind of you know so um, my favorite Matthew Shardlake who's like a 14th century lawyer <laughs> <laughs> but just like is really cool and then I want to go on a date with Jack Reacher but that's a whole nother um story so <laughs> just before we we go so um one more kind of one um, one more really quick question do you have a kind of a vision for where you think Open Table is going to go now where, where do you see it kind of going from here I think the start of it really was in my answer to why I think Open Table is important that actually I think it needs to be everywhere um and we've got, we're, we're in a lot of places now, a lot more places than we were, but there are some visible gaps on the map. So yeah. I'd like to fill them. 
um, but also just to be offering training actually, because a lot of the places that want to offer open table um, feel like they need some more support to do that. And we're, I think we're on it. So that would be yeah. really good. Yeah. And I think anything we can do around resources, helping to kind of bridge those gaps would be, I'm, I'm completely with you on that. I just think we're not, you know, we're not setting out to campaign, but actually anything we can do to raise awareness and to kind of get people um, in a more comfortable place, I think is, is, is better. And I, absolutely top priority I agree is filling some of those some of those gaps in okay so I'm conscious our time is up but thank you so much for spending time with us this evening and for your questions um, if you have kind of felt affected by anything you've heard please do reach out and seek some support you know if you go on our website you'll be able to uh, we're going to point you in the in the right direction on those Absolutely. And if there are any questions that we haven't answered as well, feel free to drop us an email and we'll Absolutely. get an answer to you. And if it's a more general answer, we'll make sure it goes on our social media too so that anyone can see it. Um, next month, our Q&A will be a conversation between two Methodists who will be talking about the recent votes on marriage, conversion therapy and gender inclusive language at the Methodist conference in June. That is Reverend Dr. Barbara Glasson, who's the former president of the Methodist Conference and the patron of Open Table, who will be in conversation with Reverend Mark Rowland, who is a founder member of Dignity and Worth, which works for LGBT plus equality in the Methodist Church. So do join us. That's on Thursday, the 23rd of September from seven till eight for an hour of reflection, insight and responses to questions live on Zoom. And just one final plea, um, if you would like to consider um, a donation to support the amazing work of Open Table Network. I feel like I should say this. Um, a link will appear as if by magic um, it's appeared um, and all your gifts are gratefully received. Thank you so much for being with us again this evening. It really is very much appreciated. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. And we'll hopefully speak to you uh, or hear from you next, next month. And I um, really look forward to hearing from um, Barbara and Mark. So thank you and have a great evening. Thanks, everyone.